welcome back to Autopsy of a Horror Movie. My name is Brucker, and today I will be going over and grading the kills of the very fun summer slasher classic Sleepaway Camp from the year 1983. And thank you so much to all of you that are already following me on Instagram and Twitter at Brucker Horror. It was you awesome people that voted for me to do a kill grade of this movie, and thank you so much. You guys have great taste. If you're not following me on Instagram at Brucker Horror, please go ahead and do so, so that way you have a voice in the next episode that I do a vote for, and you can stay up to date on what my schedule is going to be. So my history with Sleepaway Camp is actually kind of relatively new. I was pretty late to the game to discovering this movie. I got Shudder over the summer, and I saw while I was just browsing their slashers, because I'm a big slasher guy, I saw that Sleepaway Camp was on here. I saw it was kind of a cult classic, and it's just been sitting on my watch list for a long time. I finally pulled the trigger and watched it about a month or two ago, and I just fell in love with this movie. This movie is so much fun. There's so much charm and 80s cheesiness to it. I just fucking love this movie. I will be spoiling so much of this movie today. If you haven't seen it, please don't do yourself the disservice of listening to my episode and then thinking about going to watch the movie. Watch the movie, experience it, have a ball, have some popcorn, and then come back and listen to my discussion. I there's just so many things about this movie that rule. I love that it's it's just filled with so much unintentional comedy and hilarious insults from kids that I've never heard of before. Play it in there. Eat shit and die, Ricky. Eat shit and live, Bill. Bizarre overacting performances. Hurry, sweeties. We don't want to be late for the boss. Goodness, no. Now that wouldn't do at all. Richard Angela. And the world's best worst fake mustache I have ever seen, which I don't have an audio clip for. It would be weird if I did, actually. I think that one of the best things about this movie is how authentic it feels. This movie does such a good job at capturing how shitty kids are and how they interact with each other and how they actually deal with conflict. I think it's just one of the best things about this movie because they really captured that and it feels so real. It feels like somebody just went to a camp and just recorded kids and it, it just works so well. Something else about this movie that is just phenomenal to me is that this movie was put together by a bunch of people doing it for the first time. This was written and directed by first time writer and director Robert Hiltzik and I believe he was actually a film student at the time when he made this movie. And most of the kids, or pretty much all of the kids in this movie, this was their first big gig. So just seeing all of these people come together, you know, for the first time to make a movie, and it works, it really adds to my enjoyment of it, really. It's like, oh wow, these people just did it, and it works. That's awesome. They also were operating under such a small budget. They had a budget of $350,000, and this movie made $11 million in the box office. That's insane! Ugh. Ugh. There's everything about this movie works just about. Um, I do also want to say that the score of this movie is also so fucking good. I always want to point that out when it works, and it works so well here. This movie was composed by first-time movie composer... And Juilliard alum Edward Billows. The music is so dramatic, and honestly, no offense to this movie, it, the music kind of belongs in a different, better movie, but it just works so well in this as well. I just fucking love it. So let me go over some of the playmakers of this movie. So, as I said, this movie was written and directed by Robert Hiltzik. This movie stars Felisa Rose, Jonathan Turston, Karen Fields, Christopher Collette, Mike Kellen. Catherine Kahami, and Robert Earl Jones. That's right. That's James Earl Jones's father is in this movie. The fucking father of Darth Vader is in this 80s slasher. That is amazing. It adds so much more enjoyment to me. There's a lot of style and bonus points that this movie's earning with me. I'm, I'm sorry, folks. I can't stop talking about how much I how much I think this movie rules. And while I'm giving this movie a lot of praise, there there are a lot of weird things in this movie. For one thing, there's a lot of um, pedophilia tones in this movie, but this movie doesn't let those people that are kind of like pedo... Well, not kind of, they are pedophiles in the movie. The movie doesn't let them get away with that. They do get punished in this, which I really appreciate. And this movie does have a very controversial, infamous twist at the end of the movie, 
which I will kind of briefly touch on towards the end of this episode, but I'm not an expert on that kind of subject, which, again, I'll talk about towards the end. Anyways, let me go over how this episode is going to go. What are we doing here today? So this is a kill grade episode, meaning I will be going through the kills of this movie chronologically and grading them on four categories, including shock, method, style points, and since that this is sleepaway camp, meaning the shtick of the movie is that everybody that gets killed, mostly, are pretty shitty towards other people. So I'll be grading on a fourth category, which is how satisfying was it to see them get killed off? Each category will receive between 0 and 5 points, which I will tally them up, and will give them a final kill grade. At the end of the episode, I will be ranking them from worst to best, letting you know which one I thought was really shitty, and which one I thought was really fucking awesome. I am so thrilled to finally go ahead and do this. This has been sitting in my Google Doc for a very long time to do, and I'm about to get into the plot summary of the movie. After the plot summary, the rest of this episode is going to be riddled with spoilers. So if you haven't seen it, this is your final warning. Stop what you're doing. Watch it right now. It's on Shudder and it's on Tubi for free if you want commercials. Come back and enjoy this episode. But alright, pack your bags, get your marshmallows, and your bug spray. Let's go to summer camp. It is the summer of the 1980s, and Angela and her cousin Ricky have arrived to Camp Arawak. Kids, young and older, are eagerly running around the campgrounds and are filled with excitement and joy. That is, except for Angela. We discover that Angela is a very shy and reserved person that doesn't like to talk to other people. Because of this, Angela is taunted and bullied throughout the entire movie by other campers, especially her bunkmates, Judy and Meg. Angela's cousin Ricky sticks up for her throughout the course of the movie, and so does Ricky's best friend, Paul. Angela actually speaks her first words at camp to Paul after he shows how nice that he can be. Paul and Angela develop a sort of courtship throughout the course of the movie. However, the summer activities turn deadly when it is discovered that a murderer is stalking the campgrounds and is killing off campers and counselors alike. How many campers won't be finishing their summer readings this year? Let's go ahead and get to the kill grading and find out. So this movie boldly opens up with two murders right off the bat. Well, kind of murders. It's more manslaughter. Let me explain. So we see that a dad and his two kids are enjoying a day at the lake. They are kind of, you know, roughhousing, pushing each other a little bit, and the kids push the dad and them into the lake off the boat. This, is cause, this causes the boat to capsize. While this is going on, we see that a group of teenagers are water skiing. And because they're kind of shitty teenagers, they get distracted and they're not paying attention to where they're going, causing them to hit this small family in the lake, killing the dad and one of his children. This scene is filled with a lot of dramatic music, lots of screaming, and probably one of my favorite line deliveries in this movie, John. And there we have it, our first two kills of the movie, killed by distracting boat driving. Shock, eh, kind of low. I give it a two. I will say that um, this it was pretty broadcasted what was about to happen. We see that the teenagers in the boat are very distracted the whole time, and their friend that is actually water skiing is trying to yell back at them to look out, but they can't hear them, of course. So it was pretty broadcasted what was about to happen. I will say, though, I am having some shock and surprise because the movie's opening up with a double manslaughter, including a young child, so I'll give the movie some credit there, so I'll give it two points for shock. Method, I'm only going to give it a point here, being ran over by a boat. Eh, it's, it, it's not great. Not a very cool method. I'll just give it one point. For style, I'll give it some points here. I'll give it two and a half points for style. Uh, it's mostly coming from just the 80s charm of this. The music is great, and I just love that line delivery of Lenny going, John, uh, it's great. I will also say that it was kind of classy for the uh, filmmakers to not show the body of the dead kid floating. Rather, we just get a meshed up life jacket that is floating on the surface. It gives you a, a good picture of what actually happened without actually showing the dead body of a child that's all mangled up, so I appreciate that. Satisfactory? Uh, goose egg, zero points. This family was without sin, so zero points. I wasn't thrilled that they were killed off, per se. So this leaves me with a total point score of five and a half points. 
All right, sleepaway camp. We're just a couple minutes into the movie, and there's already two murders. What else you got? Next up on the kill list is Kenny, or as I wrote in my notes, Mullet Head Kid. Gosh, I wish I was around for the 80s sometimes. Anyways, so we see that a lot of the male campers are trying to go skinny dipping. It's time for skinny dipping with the boys. Well, kind of. The girls aren't really into it, so the boys just go skinny dipping on their own, which is kind of hilarious. However, Kenny is a little bit smarter than the average duck here. Kenny decides, instead of asking a girl to go skinny dipping with him, if a young lass would like to go on a canoe ride with him at night. What could be really creepy or murdery about that? So Kenny and this girl go on a canoe ride into the middle of the lake, it seems like at least. I don't. I can't tell if they're that far from shore, to be honest, but I don't think they're that far because she's able to swim back and we can still hear the other campers. Anyways. Now, you gotta remember that Kenny is a shithead teenage boy, meaning that he thinks pranks are fucking hilarious. So he decides to prank, and I'm using the biggest air quotes of all time here on this podcast. He pranks this young girl by tipping the canoe over, making her fall into the water. This, of course, pisses her off, and she decides to swim back to shore. And then Kenny does something that I have no comprehension of why he did this, but he swims underneath the canoe and he pops his head under it because the canoe has now capsized, so he's in that little air bubble, and he just starts singing. I... I, I I don't know what Kenny's doing here. It, it It's bizarre. Right in if you know what he's doing. I, I don't get it. But as he's singing, we see that a mysterious head pops up from the water looking at Kenny. Kenny looks mildly surprised, but it also seems that he knows who this person is. We, the audience, don't see the face. As Kenny says that the boys will be surprised that you're here, this mystery person dunks Kenny's head under the water to drown him. The next day, Kenny's body is discovered in a canoe, and this was a pretty awesome reveal. The canoe is flipped over with his corpse in there, skin is pale, eyes wide open, lake gunk all over him, and then a fucking snake slithers out of his mouth, and that added some really extra creepiness to me, because I fucking hate snakes. I'm like Indiana Jones. So, now Kenny is dead and his body's been discovered means it's time to grade this kill. shock eh, i'll give it two points uh there, there wasn't too many things that are really shocking about this um i think the main thing that i was mostly surprised about was just the head popping out from the water i remember i kind of i want to say i fully jumped but i twitched a little bit method and eh, two points i guess it's just a drowning but uh, i think most of my surprise with the method is that this all kind of happened within earshot of people from the shore because there's lots of witnesses here. So I thought that whoever this killer was was pretty ballsy because they're doing it around potentially tons of witnesses. So I guess I'll give it two points instead of just one because it was because it was a drowning with potential witnesses, which is kind of bleeding into my style grading here. So for style points, I'll give it three out of five points. The kill had to be stealthy because as I just mentioned, there was lots of people around. And I just love the reveal of the body with the snake coming out of his mouth. That really added a sense of just ugh to this. So I'll give it three points for style. Satisfaction. Kenny was not the most annoying person in this movie, but he also wasn't without sin. He did harass Angela before his death at the social dance, and he did that really stupid prank to that girl on the canoe. Is that really worth being killed over? Eh, I don't know, but I would be lying if I said that it wasn't mildly satisfying to watch him get killed off. So I'll say two out of five points for satisfaction, leaving me with a point total of nine points. All right, next up on the kill list is Billy, or as I would like to call him, Billy Bees. Billy and the boys are having a water balloon fight on top of the roof of their cabin in it's just like, what the fuck, what even is this camp? It's like the wild, wild west. But I'm not going to lie, I can 100% see 15-year-old Brucker trying to do the same shit. Anyways, Angela is walking over to Ricky's cabin when she is spotted by Billy. Billy arms himself with a fat water balloon and he chucks it at Angela, hitting her in the chest, causing her to fall down to the ground. A little bit after this, we cut to Billy walking back to his cabin 
As he walks in, people ask him if he's going to show up for the baseball game, and he says that he needs to take a wicked dump first, which makes me think that Billy's from Boston, and I kind of love that. When Billy goes to sit down to take his wicked shit, we see that a mysterious person is placing a stick over the handle of the bathroom stall, locking him in there. We then cut to the screen window above Billy as he is taking a dump, and a knife cuts a big slit into the screen, and then what comes in? A fucking beehive on a stick comes in and drops in there. This killer drops in a bee bomb, and the bees just start stinging and attacking Billy. And of course, he's locked in there because the stick's on the stall. But why won't he just crawl underneath the stall? I have no idea. It's, it, it, it's an unknowable question. So Billy is stuck in the stall, screaming and thrashing as he's being stung to death. He is finally able to break through the door, but it's only his limp dead body that makes it out of the stall. And I love that the camera slowly pans over his corpse as we see that his body is covered in a swarm of bees and he just has these gross red welts all over his body. And uh, it's just a fantastic little detail. I also want to point out that there are some really awesome practical effects here. If you look closely enough, some of the warts are actually just raspberries, and I just love that type of practicality. I think it's fantastic. And I want to give credit to listener and friend on Instagram, Narissa, who can be found at that point on Pike Street. Narissa pointed out to me that some of those welts are raspberries, and thank you so much, Narissa. That's such a cool little detail that I probably wouldn't have noticed, but now that I know it, that's all I see, and I kind of love it. So, Narissa, thank you so much for mentioning that. So, let's go ahead and grade Billy B's kill. Shock. A little bit more here, I'm going to give it three. While I did see his death coming... The fucking beehive was the last thing I was expecting to come through that window, man. Oh, it's just so good. I was losing it when I saw that that beehive on a stick just pop through the screen. Oh, it's just so great. So three points for shock. Method. I'm going to give it three and a half points here. I mean, being locked in a stall, being killed by a fucking beehive bomb while taking a shit, it's fucking great. Uh, it's just... Ugh, it's just so good. I love it. I just love this kill. It's so fucking awesome. And because of that, I'm going to give it a lot of style points here. I'm going to give it four points for style. Uh, lots of it is coming from those details pointed out from Narissa. Thank you again, Narissa, for pointing out the raspberries to me. And just, and I just love that he's taking a shit. And some of his last words were, I got to take a wicked dump. That's fucking fantastic. So four out of five points for style here. Satisfaction. He he was a crappy person and character, but he wasn't one of the most shitty people in this movie, so I'll say three out of five points. Like I said, he wasn't the most awful person, but it was still pretty pleasant to watch him be killed off, so three and a half points, giving me a total grade of 13 and a half points for Billy B's. Next up is one of the kills that made me flinch the most. It's The Death of Meg. Before I get to this, I want to take a moment to pause and reflect and just ask, who the hell is this character, Meg? She is bizarre. She is an awful camp counselor. She is tormenting one of her campers that she should be counseling over. And she is seducing the really old camp owner, I think, Mel? Who the fuck is this person? It's it's bizarre. She needs help. She needs a role model. Anyways. So we see that Meg has the night off while the other counselors are working the camp social slash dance. Uh, she decides to ask Mel out on the date and, arran- and arranges to have dinner with him at, I think, like 9 o'clock that night. Which just, you, Mel, say no to that. You're the adult here. You need to realize that this is wrong and she's maybe confused. And Meg, what the fuck? Anyways, so Meg goes back to her cabin to get ready for her gross hot date. But the line for the showers is too long, so she remembers that she's a character in an 80s slasher and decides to take a shower at the cabin next door, where no one is staying. Perfect. As Meg is showering and humming away, we see that a mystery person slowly opens up the door to the cabin, spilling in their shadow, which is holding a knife. Meg is, again, you know, getting all 
sudsy and everything, rinsing off. As she does this, she leans against the back wall of the shower and a fucking knife goes through the wall of the shower and into her back. And if that wasn't bad enough, the killer then pulls the knife all the way down her back, from her neck down to her butt. It is just, oof, and it just the, the strength of this killer. I mean, you're going through not only just human flesh and bone and muscle there, you're going through the fucking shower wall. This, this was a workout, guys, and it's not just like, you know, buys and tries here. There's some fucking forearm muscles here, too. As we see that Meg is dead, the killer, still we still don't see who this is, puts the knife into the shower to clean off the blood and then turns the water off because they care about the environment and saving water. For shock, I'm going to give this a 3. While I wasn't surprised that Meg died because she very much falls into the formula of this movie, I was more shocked in how she died. A knife through a shower wall that was dragged all the way down? Kind of brutal, and it it, it makes my back flinch up every time I think about it. So I'll, I'll say three, 3 out of 5 points there for shock. Method, I'm going to go with 3. It was a knife kill in a slasher movie, but it was more creative than than just being stabbed in the gut, so I'll give it three out of five points. Style, I'll give it three out of five points as well. I thought this kill had a lot of style to it, going through the shower wall all the way down. I just thought it worked really well, so three out of five points. For satisfaction, three and a half points. It was very satisfying watching Meg get killed off. She was awful to Angela and a, just a really shitty person. So I was pretty thrilled that she got killed off. So three and a half points for satisfaction of Meg getting killed off. With almost a perfect three across the board, Meg tallies to a total of 12 and a half points for her kill. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it is now time for the most infamous kill of the movie, Judy's. So, Judy is a really shitty person. She is, as I said, Meg was really awful to Angela, but Judy was way worse, I think. Judy was just relentless in this fucking movie. So, I guess you can kind of tell where my satisfaction score is going to be, but let's cover this kill first. We see that Judy and a boy have decided to ditch the camp social, and they're back in her cabin in the dark making out. They are interrupted by Mel, who is looking for his underaged hot date, Meg. Gross. After Mel leaves, Judy's makeout partner decides to split because he feels a little worried and kind of paranoid that Mel's going to catch them. A now pissed off Judy decides to stay alone in her cabin, curling her hair in the dark because, again, she's a character in an 80s slasher movie, so she has to play by these rules. Anyways... As she's curling her hair in the dark, a mystery person opens the door to the cabin. We do get a look at them, but it's kind of distorted and we can't really tell who this person is. The killer walks over to Judy, punches her out cold, and then begins to put a pillow over her face and you start to think, oh, death by suffocation. Interesting. No, that's not what's happening here. As depicted by the sinister and murderous puppet show that's being displayed on the wall here, we see that the killer picks up the still left on curling iron of Judy, and then this person sticks it where the sun don't shine. Woo, gosh, after you see the motion, Judy's hands jump right up, and she is screaming into the pillow that's being muffled, and she is just wriggling around and everything, and is just, yikes, this is a very brutal kill. And this is one of those kills where I found myself kind of nervously laughing through it. Eh, you know, you just got to do what you got to do to get through these. Judy eventually stops moving around, indicating that she has died. And the killer puts her underneath the bed, ending Judy and removing her from the rest of the movie. Whew. Okay, so shock. Three and a half points mostly from the brutality of it. I was kind of surprised at how brutal this was. Method, full five out of five points here. This was an insane and horrible method to die by, so it has to earn a five. Style points, I'm going to give it four. Please forgive me for awarding any sort of style to this, but it really did earn them. I appreciate that this kill does take place off screen. It's mostly being depicted by shadows. This makes it both 
better and worse at the same time, so I'm going to give it four points. Satisfaction, five out of five points. Judy was one of the worst people in this movie. I was rooting for her to die the whole time. Not exactly sure I was rooting for something this brutal, but man, I felt like I needed a cigarette after this kill, so five out of five points for Satisfactory giving me a total kill grade of 17 and a half points. Phew, you go, Glen Coco. I mean, Judy. Okay, these next four kills that I'm about to go over all take place at once, and it kind of sucks I gotta do this, but I have to. It is a weird part of the movie that I have seen that the director has gone back to say that he regrets having these kills in here, but four kids in sleeping bags get murdered. We see that a male camp counselor has drawn the short straw for the night and it's his duty to take six young boys out to sleep underneath the stars. And it's really weird that they only gave this duty to one camp counselor. This really should have been done by multiple camp counselors to take care of all those kids out in the woods. Anyways, two of the six boys wake up uncomfortable wanting to go back to their cabin. So the camp counselor obliges since the other four campers are still asleep. We then get the POV of the killer picking up a hatchet. We then cut back to the male camp counselor arriving back to this site, discovering that all of the boys have been hacked to death and butchered in their sleep. It is a real mess here at this site. The camping bags have been torn to shreds, there's feathers everywhere, blood everywhere, causing the camp counselor to vomit. And that's pretty much where we're at. We thankfully don't really see the bodies of the kids, but it was kind of brutal and felt almost unnecessary. Um, so anyways, let's go ahead and grade this. For shock, I'm going to give it 3 out of 5 points. I was surprised that they went ahead and killed an additional 4 young kids in this movie, especially in such a violent manner, so I'll give it 3 out of 5 points. Method, I'm going to give it 1, being butchered to death in their sleep, and it happened off screen in between scenes, eh, 1 point there. Style, 3. I guess I'll give it some credit here. I will say the hacked up sleeping bags with the blood was a really great effect. The music was very dramatic and just really swelled this scene, so it was earning some points there. Satisfaction, zero. These kids really didn't deserve it. The worst thing that they did was that they threw sand at Angela after Meg threw her into the lake. So, and, and they're just little shit kids. They would have thrown sand at anyone that walked by, so they don't deserve it. Zero points for satisfaction leaving me with a total kill grade of these four kills to be seven points. Alrighty, we just got a couple more kills left. Let's go ahead and take a quick break, and we'll be right back to wrap up the kill grade. So we continue the kill grade with somebody who I think really earned a spot on the body count, and that would be Mel. Mel finds Meg's corpse in the shower, and he is for some reason convinced that Ricky killed her. In fact, he's been thinking the whole time that Ricky is killing all the people at the camp, which is based off of really nothing. It doesn't make any sense. We also find out that Mel is super self-centered. He thinks that Ricky is killing all these people to get to Mel, and that getting to Meg was the last straw for him. It's as if Mel thinks Ricky is working for the fucking Green Goblin because Meg stole his heart. The cunning warrior attacks neither body nor mind. Tell me how! The heart, Osborne. First, we attack his heart. So anyways, Mel is now on a manhunt to find Ricky and to kill him. He spots Ricky eating a fucking candy bar, like the most childish thing I think a person can do. He is walking back to his cabin, eating a candy bar. He drags Ricky into the woods where he slaps Ricky so hard he falls to the ground. Ricky is crying. He doesn't really understand what's going on. And then Mel proceeds to beat the shit out of him. But he does this in the weirdest, most dramatic way. He's pounding his open palms and hands on Ricky like an ape that's really pissed off or something. It's, it, it, it's weird. It's so fucking weird. Mel thinks that he has killed Ricky, and spoiler, Ricky's alive, so he didn't kill him, but Mel thinks that he has killed Ricky. He emerges from the woods, thinking that he has claimed a victory over his Meg killer, walking into the archery range. Then he sees an unknown person holding a bow and arrow. Mel then realizes, uh uh-oh, Ricky wasn't the killer, this person was. And as the synapses smack in his brain, he is hit in the neck with an actual arrow. It goes right through him, and it looks 
fucking beautiful Mel is finally dead. This was a really fun kill. For shock, I'll give it two points. I was kind of sh shocked that he was killed, but not incredibly shocked. He did fall into the formula of the movie, but it was kind of surprising because we haven't seen an adult be successfully murdered in this movie. So I was kind of surprised at that. So two out of five points for shock. Method. Arrow through the neck. Pretty fucking sweet. Three, three points out of five. I loved it. Style. Three and a half points. I really love this kill. I love that he literally stumbles out of the woods and straight into his own death. The effect of the arrow going through his neck looks really good, and I still don't know how they did it, but I don't want to know. I'll let the magic of the movies get me on this one. And satisfaction? Five. Five out of five. Mel was a creep. He was lying about all the murders that were going on because he didn't want the parents to find out about it and lose their money. He was just... He was just a shit person, and I was so happy that he died. This gives me a total kill grade for Mel at 13.5 points. Now it is time for the final kill of the movie in the most controversial part of the movie as well. It is the death of Paul. Angela has agreed to meet with Paul down by the lake. When they meet up, we see that they decide to go skinny dipping together. Paul is very excited by this, but we see that there's something off with Angela, more than normal. We cut to two camp counselors, Ronnie and Mary, who are walking to the lake because they're looking for people because they are now discovering that there is a killer on the loose and they're trying to round everyone up. They stumble upon a nude Angela that is holding the severed head of Paul in her lap. Angela stands up, revealing that she has a penis and is actually a boy? We find out through a cutscene that at the beginning of the movie where the dad and the two kids were hit by the boat, Peter was not hit by the boat and actually survived, but his sister died unfortunately. Peter went to go live with his Aunt Martha and Cousin Ricky. However, his Aunt Martha had always wanted a little girl, so she decided to raise Peter as Angela. And this movie ends with that twist reveal. So that is what's kind of controversial and problematic about this movie which i will talk about in a moment however let's go ahead and grade this kill shock four out of five points it is kind of hard to separate the death of paul from this infamous scene but even if you kind of do take away all that emotions it's still very shocking because paul doesn't fall into the typical pattern as the other victims he was really nice he was a little pushy at times with Angela pushing her boundaries and how comfortable she was willing to go physically, but all in all, Paul was, for the most part, a genuine person, so it was kind of surprising that he died, especially in the manner that he died too, a beheading that took place off screen, that's kind of brutal. For Method, I'm only giving one and a half points. Decapitations are cool, but it took place off screen! Show me how that happened, man! Style, I'll give it three points. I guess I'm giving it some style points for killing off someone we didn't expect and for being part of such an infamous uh, scene of the movies. So I'll give it three out of five points there. Satisfaction? Zero. I loved Paul. No, I wasn't happy that he got killed off. So yeah, zero points for satisfaction. Giving me a total kill grade of eight and a half points for poor Paul. Alright, so by my calculations, there were 12 kills in Sleepaway Camp, and here are my rankings. Taking 12th and 11th place are the dad and daughter at 5.5 points. Places 10 through 7 are the four little boys that were murdered in their sleeping bags, earning 7 points. At 6th place is Paul, with 8 points. At 5th place is Kenny, or Mullet Head Kid, as I wrote in my notes, earning 9 points. At 4th place, Meg. It was Meg with 12 and a half points. Third place, it was Mel at 13 and a half points. And breaking the tiebreaker at second place was Billy, who also had 13 and a half points. He beat out Mel just because he died on the toilet, just like the King of Rock did. So, he earned points for that. And coming in at number one with 17 and a half points, it was no contest. All of you that seen the movie knew that this was going to be number one. It was Judy. Thank you.
Thank you so much, you guys, for listening to this episode. Before we go, I kind of feel like I need to sort of address the controversial scene in this movie. I have to admit, I am not an expert on queer representation in horror or film. While I completely understand and see how this, how that scene may seem harmful to the queer and transgender community, I'm simply not educated enough to do a deep dive into it and be able to give you a thorough examination of that infamous scene. I do, however, think that it is important to be able to acknowledge and point out sins of movies like this and be able to point out how it paints being transgender as a lifestyle choice because Aunt Martha forced it on Peter, but in reality, it's not a lifestyle choice. It's not a choice at all. It, 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 people are just people are born that way, and that's kind of something that we need to accept. This movie also depicts the only transgender character in the movie as a murderer and, and kind of suggests that is why Angela is violent. Which again, going off the numbers, is not true at all. Transgender individuals are some of the most vulnerable people out there, with 65% of them experiencing discrimination in public places and 70% of them enduring harassment or abuse at some point. And again, that's kind of my interpretation. My interpretation coming from this movie was that Angela was a transgender ind individual However, I had a nice conversation with somebody that's way more educated on the topic named Adam, who is the co-host of the terrific podcast, The Great American Scream, who was kind of able to enlighten me his interpretation on this, explaining that he doesn't think that Angela was actually coded as a transgender person, but somebody that was more going through gender dysphoria and how it is kind of explaining that the movie might be depicting gender dysphoria as something that is harmful and people going through that to be violent. Um, again, I am not an expert on this, but I would love to revisit this movie through a horror review and kind of get into things, but I'm not an expert and I can't really provide a voice for any sort of queer community because I'm a straight white guy and I don't know what it's like to have poor representation in movies for a community that I'm a part of. So if you are a transgender individual or a member of the queer community that would love to join me in reviewing this movie, I would love to have that discussion with you. So please reach out. You can reach out to me on Instagram at Brooker Horror or email me at BrookerHorror at gmail.com. All right, guys. Thank you so much for listening. Please let me know your thoughts on this movie and which, which kill you thought was the best. You can comment on my Instagram post for my new episode post for this. Leave me an iTunes review or email me at brookerhorror at gmail.com. Thank you guys so much again for voting on this. And please stay tuned for my episode next week. I am so excited. It is going to be my first special topics episode. I'm having two very fun guests come on. I'm having Adam of The Great American Scream and Dustin of Dustin Canary to come on to talk about some Scream movies. I'll reveal the topic then. Thank you guys so much for listening. Share me with a friend or family member and enjoy some good movies. Mm -hmm.